Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day everyone. The last aspect, an important one nonetheless, but slightly different from what we have studied so far in the immune system diseases is what is called as amyloidosis. Now this has its place in the immune system disorder because of some of the cells which engage and result in the pathogenesis of the disease are entirely that of the immune system. Now what is amyloidosis? This is your textbook definition. It says it is a condition which is not a simple one, but a very complex one where there are inherited and inflammatory disorders. What happens because of this? The end result is you get a extracellular deposition of proteins which should not be there in the first place. What happens to that? Because of the increase in deposition of these proteins, they are responsible for tissue damage and functional compromise of the cells. So they are inherited and inflammatory disorders. You know that you are talking about the immune system there extracellular deposits of the material in the tissue in the stroma resulting in damage of the principal tissue where they are deposited. Now the usually that you have proteins which are synthesized anyway, but the excess of these proteins have a tendency to aggregate, misfold and deposit. That is one aspect of it. Sometimes because of the inherited forms of the disease, you may get misfolded proteins itself which are synthesized. What happens to them? They polymerize or they aggregate resulting in formation of fibrils as we call them. They are highly insoluble. That is why they deposit in the uh, tissue and they are not scavenged away by this. Now that is just a window into what is coming up in the next half an hour or so. Very interesting topic which is amyloidosis. Now why is it called as amyloidosis? It, if you break down the word it is amyloid. So it is it looks something like amylase or starch. It looks like starch so it, they call it amyloid. It also uh, important to know that this property comes from the presence of sugar moiety. The carbohydrate moiety which is present there, it gives it a starch like characteristics. That is why they have called it amyloidosis and it has stayed its course over the period of last few decades. Now you can see then why do we have to learn about amyloidosis? Now this is important because clinically you may not be able to detect amyloidosis. It is one of those conditions which slip by and only a light microscopy and ancillary test will give you the answer to your questions. Although they have far reaching systemic effects and the patient may come to you with very confusing signs and symptoms, the index of suspicion for amyloidosis even in this stage is very poor. So because it gets deposited in multiple tissues in extracellular space, they cause damage. That is they are compromising the area which is present already there resulting in pressure atrophy of the adjacent cells. So they are causing pressure over the adjacent cells to survive which does not happen. What happens there? As a result of this you get functional inability of the cells that is compromise in the function of the cells. Clinical recognition as I told you is extremely late in the course of the disease. It may be very advanced at the time of detection of the disease. So you have to rely over good old pathology, specifically the histopathology aspect of it which will give you a definitive answer. So let us try to understand amyloid in terms of the properties. So what are they endowed with and how does it affect the cells? Now physical nature of the amyloid if you do, you have to do an electron microscopy. You are going to go right down to the level of electron microscopy. You will see that they are continuous non-branching fibrils. So electron microscopy wise remember they are continuous and non-branching fibrils with the diameter ranging somewhere between 7.5 to 10 nanometers. Imagine it being like a stack of hay which are arranged continually and non-branching. So a hay stack kept in front of you is something that is analogous to the nature of the amyloid as you will see it under electron microscopy. You may resort to even a higher end one such as an X-ray crystallography or even infrared spectrophotometry. Now these are important because you want to even a detailed study of the structure of the amyloid is what you are uh, wanting to see. You can see that they have a characteristic cross beta pleated sheet appearance. Now these are very specific features of amyloid. If you have access to these and look under a microscopy for the same, you may be able to see. 
This is schematic representation just underlying what we have said earlier. These are fibrils like stack of hay and there are molecules which are adjoining them which is congruent dye which binds to them and helps us to identify in the first place. But try to understand that it looks something like this, continuous non-branching fibrils. This is an electron microscopy image, you can see the continuous non-branching fibrils. Apart from the physical property, they have unique chemical properties. If you study them, you will see that a vast majority of them, 95 percent or so, have what are called as fibril proteins. And de facto 5 percent is what is called as P component and other glycoproteins. Now, this is something of the chemical nature of the amyloid. There are three major biochemical proteins and there are four or five minor elements to this. The major important one is what is called as amyloid-like protein or AL protein. Then you have called amyloid associated protein, AA protein. You have beta amyloid protein, these are three major which are marked in yellow. You have other molecules such as transthyretin, TTR, beta 2 microglobulin, prion proteins and the miscellaneous other ones. So as you can see there are three major ones and there are four or five minor ones. We will study each of this in a little detail. Why do you want to study about this, do you ask? because some of the diseases are specifically associated with these proteins. Let us take the first major protein, amyloid-like protein. Now these are usually comprehensive light chains with a kappa or lambda or sometimes they are amino terminal fragments or sometimes they are combination of both. It can happen in any configuration. They are primarily associated with plasma cell dyscrasia or plasma cell tumors such as a myeloma. You will see often that in a bone marrow you may not see the abnormal plasma cells, but there will be sheets and sheets of pink material which is nothing but AL type of protein. In contrast, your AA or amyloid associated protein are non immunoglobulin They are usually derived from the liver because the large molecule weighing let us say 12,000 Daltons or so is called as serum amyloid associated protein or SAAP. Now there is selective proteolysis of this larger parent molecule and you get a derivative which is AA amyloid and this by and large is associated with a lot of inflammatory diseases. Over the years they have seen that there is an intimate association between AA amyloid and chronic inflammatory disorders and these are sometimes referred to as secondary amyloidosis. So secondary amyloidosis you are talking AA protein. Another unique but still a major protein is beta amyloid ones. These our understanding from this comes mainly from autopsies where you see plaques in the CNS uh, especially from patients from Alzheimer's disease. So at the core of these neurofibrillary tangles and plaques you will see this particular beta amyloid protein. So they also are synthesized from a, a larger precursor molecule edited and made more functional. Some of the minor molecules you can, one can start with transthyretin or TTR as it is abbreviated. It is a combination of thyroxin and retinol. It is a transporter basically molecule for these two entities. You can see some amount of deposition of these in heart in aging individuals where it is called as senile amyloidosis. But a mutant form of this is one which is of interest here because you can see in conditions such as familial amyloid polyendocrinopathy where you will see this being deposited in the tissues which is pathological. Beta 2 microglobulin our understanding comes of this from a long association with hemodialysis. Patients with chronic renal failure have to resort to hemodialysis and you will see that uh, this uh, earlier certainly the filters which were used never used to allow this molecule to pass, they would accumulate there. But now of course those technologies have changed but our understanding initially comes from that aspect. We also have studied this if you hark back your memory towards the structure of MHC. We also have seen that it is a component of class 1 MHC within the uh, let us say the receptor structure of it. You can go back and refer. Another one which is a distinct category is called as prion proteins. Uh, again, they are associated with CNS diseases called prion diseases as said, such as you might have heard of mad cow disease, Crutzfeld Jacobson disease. All of these have typical characteristics of amyloid. So, they are also clubbed under uh, some of the biochemical forms. And then you have the minor components such as uh, amyloid P component which has a role in uh, stabilizing the fibrils and reducing the clearance, sulfated glycosaminoglycans and even proteoglycans which form the component of this miscellaneous aspect. So these are some of the chemical aspects of amyloid. Now let us study what happens under the pathogenesis of the disease. 
Now, under normal physiology, this is easy to know. You will have proteins which are synthesized. They have to be used in some form or the other. Once their function is over, what should happen? They have to be cleared off, right? They should not overstay. They are welcome. But imagine a condition where there is excess of proteins or even proteins in normal amount which are misfolded. They should not be around. So, what does body do? The body tries to degrade them both by intra and extracellular mechanism. Intracellular mechanism usually is by proteasome formation where it breaks down the molecule. This is usually uh, which is done by proteasome or you have extracellular material or protein which is broken down by macrophages or scavengers. Finally, they are degraded and you are back to neutral. Now, imagine having known this physiology, please imagine a condition where these two mechanisms are ineffective. Extra and intercellular material which are in excess are no longer degraded. So, they will accumulate in the tissue. Hence, the excess of these material is seen. This is typical of amyloid formation. At the core of it, this is a simplistic version of what happens in amyloidosis. So, pathogenesis we want to study the excess of proteins and proteins which are not in excess but are mutant or misfolded. So, what happens? As a result of this, this excess proteins eventually they tangle up. It is like hair you might have seen. Excess hair what happens to it? It tangles and forms a mass. So, because of the improper folding they associate and result in formation of fibrils. At the same time, the misfolded proteins are prone to more, more misfolding, more aggregation and more insolubility. Eventually what happens is they get deposited in an insoluble form especially in the extracellular tissues which we term as amyloidosis. So, this is a more textbook version of what we have discussed in the last couple of slides. As you can see the initial stimulus on the left of your screen you can see there is soluble precursor molecule which is misfolded and finally becomes insoluble. You can see there is, uh, let us take the context of unknown carcinogens. Okay, you can see there is monoclonal activation of the B lymphocytes. The template example for this is myeloma, where you will see increase in number of plasma cells, will produce a lot of light chains of the immunoglobulins. There will be limited proteolysis of these immunoglobulins and they accumulate. This is what is called as your AL or primary amyloidosis. If you take the context of uh, abnormal amounts of proteins which are elaborated in chronic inflammation, it is chiefly to do with a lot of macrophage activation which uh, there will be release of cytokines affects your liver cells and we know liver is a storehouse factory produce large molecules. Your SAAP is very uh, prevalent in these conditions. It will be addicted to form AA type of amyloid because of limited proteolysis they accumulate in the tissue resulting in secondary amyloidosis. The next aspect in the far right of your screen you can see that they are talking about production of normal amounts of amyloid but the catch phrase is mutant example transthyretin. So, the mutation resulting in a soluble precursor form becoming completely insoluble you result in what is called as ATT R protein which is deposited in different tissues. So, this is a pathogenesis of amyloidosis. So, how else do you classify as we have alluded to earlier primary you are talking about AL, secondary you are talking about AA and then there is what is called as heredofamilial amyloidosis which runs in families. Okay, so, they are distinctive patterns of localized involvement of the organs where you have to study them in little detail and deduce that they are amyloid components. So, this is what is given in most standard textbooks. You are talking about the classification of myeloidosis as you can see there is something called as generalized or systemic amyloidosis and your AL and A1 that is your uh, secondary amyloidosis or primary associated with myelomas, chronic inflammation do come here. You can have heredofamilial ones such as familial Mediterranean fever or um, amyloidotic polyneuropathies for example. They are associated with SAA and transthyretin respectively or even something like serum, uh, senile amyloidosis also is heredofamilial which is associated with ATTR. Then you have what is called as a localized forms of the disease which affect specific organs let us say CNS. We have spoken about Alzheimer's earlier. Other than that you can have them associated with prion diseases which I spoken about earlier and importantly in the context of tumor you have couple of endocrine tumors where you will see amyloid deposition. One chief one is medullary carcinoma of thyroid and sometimes even in type 2 diabetes in the islets of Langerhans in your pancreas you can see this amyloid being deposited. So, if you look at the morphology of this all the organs of the body are 
inescapable it will affect each and every organ. So, there is no particular trend or pattern where it has a uh, tropism towards, but you will see certain organs being affected more than the others. Kidney is affected by amyloid is quite often you will see a renal biopsy show a lot of amyloid deposits. It is the most common and certainly the most serious of the ones and kidney how do you think it looks? Sometimes it is large, but by and large you will see a normal or even a shrunken kidney mainly because of ischemia. As we said earlier they get deposited on the vessel walls, they um, compromise the lumina of the vessels resulting in ischemia and thus resulting in necrosis of the organ. Deposits can be in the mesangium where there are very uh, thickening of the mesangium there. They can deposit within the glomerular base membrane, even in the peritubular areas, chiefly in the perivascular spaces. And how will you look at it? When you look at it under light microscopy, they appear as very confluencing broad ribbons, pink ribbons as you see it under H and E sections in the interstitial space, perivascular and peritubular tissues. Spleen in the context of spleen is normal to markedly enlarged because it is another reticular endothelial organ. So, it is inescapable that it is involved there as well, but it is seen that there are two particular patterns which is harped upon is what is called as a deposit. It entirely depends on where the deposits are. If it is in the splenic follicles, lymphoid follicles, you get large tapioca like granules like grains of sago as they are called. So, they are called as sago spleen. Sometimes you will get very walls of the splenic sinuses and entire stroma of the red pulp with lot of map like geographic areas of deposition. If that is the case you call it lardaceous spleen. So, remember sago spleen and lardaceous spleen. There are two patterns essentially of amyloidosis. In the liver again causes hepatomegaly sometimes very massive uh, enlargement of the liver. The usually it is the area is a space of disay where they are involved and then of course, they enroach upon their hepatic parenchyma resulting in atrophy. Vascular involvement again is a feature there in the heart. Again, it can be normal, enlarged, or firm, usually within the sub endocardial areas which they accumulate, and even sometimes in the myocardium. If that is the case, then it results in ECG abnormalities. That is the only way to pick them up, otherwise, there is no other modes of presentation. The other organs, such as adrenal, thyroid, pituitary. Usually the blood vessels are the areas where you want to concentrate and look at the wall of the blood vessels. If they are showing some pink material which is extracellular and you are unusually thick outside of arterial sclerosis you may want to think about amyloid. You can deposit in the tongue, okay, so you can have what is called as um, a tumor forming amyloid of the tongue, respiratory CNS, wrist lesser known fact it is one of the causes for carpal tunnel syndrome outside of conditions such as hypothyroidism resulting and also your ergonomics where it comes into play people using computers for a long time. Sometimes you can get deposits of amyloid along the retinaculum, the flexor retinaculum resulting in carpal tunnel syndrome. The last aspect of this is the diagnosis of amyloid. So, how do you diagnose it? Clinically the index of suspicion is poor as I have said earlier, very vague organ involvement. So, how does one come to terms with the diagnosis. Now, you may want to resort with good old electrophoresis. Since these are proteins, you want to see them being earmarked some way. Electrophoresis may be your first chance at it. it you can use serum, urine or even other molecules. Electrophoresis will be the way to go. Bone marrow examination, sometimes like I have told you, they will resort to bone marrow and you will see a lot of plasma cells and there will be a lot of sheets and sheets of amyloid. That may be one. If you have a lot of money with you, you can resort to scintigraphy, radio label scintigraphy which can detect certain components of amyloid, but not all of them. You can confirm this with a biopsy, uh, invasive procedure, but you can take an abdominal fat, rectal mucosa, gingiva or the kidney. These are four areas generally where the surgeons do concentrate upon to maybe have an idea that it could be amyloid or at last you will have to of course, at the end of the day you will have to do a light microscopy and demonstrate it using special stains which is a lot of interest in literature in pathology because often asked around in a lot of exams. Your first interface will be an H and E, hematoxylin and eosinophil. You will see in hematoxylin and eosinophil they appear very acidophilic or eosinophilic in color, very pink masses. Do a pass what is called as per iodic acid shift which of course, stains glycogen. They appear very magenta pink in color because there is a component of glycosaminoglycans there. You can do a Congo red. This is a chief stain generally for amyloid which stains it a very pink color. Combine this with a polarized microscopy you will see what is called as an apple green birefringence. Under polarizer we have some of the images coming up later. 
can do a metachromatic stain such as tolerated in blue. You can see metachromasia, couple of colors with that you see within the tissue. Or you can take thioflavin T and thioflavin S which gives a fluorescence cell. It is a fluorescence based technique which will highlight a myeloid or you can take serious red which gives as the name indicates a red color. So, you can resort to any of these stains, but by and large most labs in a country resort to H and E followed by congruent and you can do certainly a polarizing microscopy to demonstrate a myeloid. So, these are some of the images coming up. You can see there is H and E stain. This is from the spleen. You can see the large lakes of pink extracellular and very amorphous material outside in the stroma that is nothing but amyloid. This is not a sci-fi image, what you are looking at essentially is apple green birefringens. You can see the color almost staring at you, that is amyloid there. More map like areas here, again amyloid under polarizer. This is Congo red, uh, you can see that red areas there which is brought about by almost pink color which is brought about by Congo red. Peradic acid shift which gives a magenta color almost here. You can see the outlines which are stained in pink. Within the globulus you can see small structures which are taken up pink color typically that of a myeloid. With this we come to the close of this topic on amyloidosis. It is a very distinctive entity but one that you have to know nonetheless. Associated with the immune system had a very distinctive pathogenesis but as we have understood they are associated with a multitude of conditions ranging from purely physiological to entirely pathological. So, if one has to understand this disease a little more better. Please remember the stains which are used for staining amyloid and some of the properties, chemical and physical aspects of this disease. I hope you had a good time listening to this in the last half an hour or so. Thank you for your patience.